I recently read a copy of Technics and Civilization by Lewis Mumford. My father had read it, and so he gave me a copy as a gift. And it's an interesting book, and it's prescient, actually, in a lot of ways that it approaches our relationship with technology. As I read it, one of the more interesting concepts that I came across is this idea about how the monastic movement codifies the artificial concept that is time. You know, specifically, that through monasteries, we see the creation of the first real functioning clocks. Why, though? Why would that be? Well, Mumford argues that, you know, machines first come into being as a need to keep time. Monks and the monastic movement, they needed to keep time because the rule of St. Benedict, which is codified sometime between the 8th and 9th centuries, you have to have an accurate accounting of time. And that's because St. Benedict's rule organizes the monastic day into regular periods, sometimes communal, sometimes private prayer. There's a time for sleep. There's a time for spiritual reading. And of course, there's time for manual labor. In Latin, ut in omnibus glorificat Deus, quote, things that in all God may be glorified, end quote. Eventually, you know, you'd see things like scribe work and other components, all things that we know of when we think of the monastic movement come into being. But all of this life was based on a rigid schedule, schedule that was really kind of unique in history up until this point. And I'm going to talk about this a couple of times. Labor and the idea of how you would go about your day was what well, we would say task oriented. You know, the vast majority of life is agriculture. You have whatever your task is for the day. Maybe it's sowing wheat. Maybe it's mending a fence, whatever it may be. But your job is to complete that task. It doesn't matter when you start and when you stop. Time is irrelevant to the question of labor at this point. But for the first time, sort of the life of a daily human being gets regimented around this concept of time, of appointed hours during the day. Specifically, the daily life of a Benedictine monk revolved around eight canonical hours. This is the monastic timetable. It's like a schedule. It begins at midnight with the service or the office. These are called offices of matins, followed by the morning office at Louds. It's supposed to be at 3 a.m. So there's eight services. So it's every three hours to get 24 hours. Louds and, and matins, by the way, weren't like quick get up and say a prayer and go back to sleep sort of a thing. And I think you can tell already monks don't get to sleep through the entire evening. These Services could be long. Sometimes they lasted until dawn. Sometimes there were a chant. There'd be psalms involved, maybe even lessons. And of course, there's the celebration of tons of local saint days. And I'm going to get into the idea of the calendar in a little bit. After louds, the monks would go back to sleep for a little bit. And then you get at 6 a.m. for prime. This would be followed by a service at 9 a.m. called the Office of Terse. At noon, you'd have sext, and then you'd be able to rest until the office of known at 3 p.m. This was, of course, followed by a period of work, vespers at 6 p.m., and then compline at 9, and then they go to bed, and the whole thing would start over again. Over and over and over again, and it had to be the same. That was the key. You had to know that it was three hours between Vespers and Compline or between any 
of the two successive hours. This is really unique in human history. Not even Roman legions were this regimented, and they were pretty regimented. Now, part of all this comes out of this desire to make sure that everyone's going to be saved, that everybody is doing the good works correctly in the Middle Ages. That's why this intense need to keep time is evolving. One of the big people who's so fascinated in making sure that his kingdom is a godly kingdom is Charlemagne. Charlemagne is absolutely desperate in the late 8th, early 9th century to make sure that not only his people are reading the correct Bible, they're being taught the right things, but that they're doing it at the right moments. He's very interested in seeing the monastic movement spread and seeing schools and education reform and all these other things. All of it is to make sure that they're glorifying God, and not only that, but glorifying God in the right way. Because Charlemagne sees the opposite as being the potential conclusion that his people, his kingdom, might be condemned to hell. That is unacceptable. Remember, the medieval worldview is very different from our own. Everything that we might say nowadays is excessive religious fanaticism. But that would just be normal behavior. It's to be expected. The focus is on the life to come, not this current one. Because as historians have written about the Middle Ages, life in the Middle Ages is nasty, brutish, and short. Here's what Mumford has to say about the importance of keeping time in his book. Quote, So one is not straining the facts when one suggests that the monasteries, at one time there were more than 40,000 under Benedictine rule, helped to give human enterprise the regular collective beat and rhythm of the machine. For the clock is not merely a means of keeping track of the hours, but of synchronizing the actions of men, end quote. Now, for Mumford, this is all tied into this notion of what makes something a machine, which in and of itself is kind of an interesting topic and something that I might come back to a little bit later on. The author first distinguishes tools from machines because that's an important distinction and a line of demarcation that has to be drawn. Here's what he writes. Quote, The essential distinction between a machine and a tool lies in the degree of independence in the operation from the skill and the motive power of the operator. The tool lends itself to manipulation, the machine to automatic action. End quote. It's a good distinction and something that's crucial for our understanding of time. Because, obviously, in a non-slave-based society, you can't have someone who's there running some sort of a tool to keep track of every minute of every day. You need a machine. You need something that's going to do it automatically. And tools, of course, have existed since Neolithic times, and rudimentary ones, I mean a stick, can be a tool, certainly well before then. But for this episode, I want to come back to the idea of time, because that's what I'm interested in right now. That's what the book got me interested in thinking about. Specifically the question of, okay, when did humankind come up with the idea of time. And then taking it a step further, how has our conception of time changed, you know, since the ancient days, the land of the Pharaoh through the Roman Empire, monastic orders and monks, 
keeping track of the different canonical hours of the day through the industrial revolution all the way to modern day smartphones. Because I think that there's something kind of interesting here. I really do think there's an interesting question to be asked, an interesting answer to be had when it comes down to how do we shape time as human beings, as a sort of global civilization? And then how has time shaped us? Because once you start to measure time, sure, then you can measure it in a sort of objective sense. But there are always going to be components of the system that are totally arbitrary. I'll, I'll get to them a little bit later on there. And since there's this arbitrary nature, then that means that we are controlling time to an extent. Just something maybe that you can't do with distance, that you can't do with weight, that you can't do with other things that you measure. And time is so ubiquitous in our world. You might not be affected by anything else that I talk about in any of these series, but you're affected by time. We all are. And to an extent, we're all affected by the arbitrary decisions that we've made and that have been made by our ancestors. So there's two concepts of time that I want to talk about today. The first I'm going to say is kind of like, it's like calendar versus the clock, right? Days versus hours. Because there's two conceptions of time that have sort of dominated in human history. One is, okay, how do we measure time in terms of a yearly cyclical fashion? So how do I know when my birthday is? How do I know when a saint's feast day is? How do I know when a named day is in the Mayan calendar? How do I measure time in sort of a long game? So that's one. Then the second one, the one that I think is actually a little bit more interesting is how do you measure time in a micro fashion? So how do we measure time and how does time affect us in the hours and the minutes of a given day? That's the one that, believe it or not, I still think is more important than the macro level. At least today it is. But I'll get into that one in a little bit. I'm going to start with the calendar. We're going to start with the macro. We're going to get down to the micro in a little bit. Here's what Mumford has to say about this idea. Quote, When one thinks of the day as an abstract span of time, one does not go to bed with the chickens on a winter's night. One invents wicks, chimneys, lamps, gaslights, electric lamps, so as to use all the hours belonging to the day. When one thinks of time not as a sequence of experiences, but as a collection of hours, minutes, and seconds, the habits of adding time and saving time come into existence. Time took on the character of an enclosed space, It could be divided. It could be filled up. It could even be expanded by the invention of labor-saving instruments. One ate, not upon feeling hungry, but when prompted by the clock. One slept, not when one was tired, but when the clock sanctioned it. End quote. Now, according to my research, if we think about the macro level, so if we start to think about a calendar... Well, humans have been keeping track of the cycles of the sun and the moon almost as far back as we can go. Fairly recently, it seems, we found the oldest, very rudimentary calendar system, which dates back to almost 8,000 BCE in, uh, I might get this wrong, Aberdeenshire, 
in Scotland. This predates some Near Eastern calendars by nearly 5,000 years. Researchers discovered that a monument created by hunter-gatherer societies in Scotland nearly 10,000 years ago appears to mimic the phases of the moon in order to track the lunar months over the course of the year, which is interesting for a reason that I'll get into in a little bit, because it's very common when you get close to the equator for these early civilizations and societies to go with lunar months rather than solar months. But as you get further from the equator, that becomes less the case. Scotland is pretty far from the equator, so that makes this a little bit unique. The site at Warren Field actually also aligns with the midwinter sunrise. So it, it's kind of both lunar and solar, I suppose, up there in Scotland. And this provides an annual astronomic correction in order to maintain the link between the passage of the time because there's a big difference, you know, and we'll get into it in a second, but there's a big difference between a lunar year and a solar year. And trying to link up those asynchronous functions is something that early humankind was trying to do, I guess, from the very beginning. So from the very beginning, humans are trying to use the two things that are regular in the world, the two things that right away they can try to measure and that we figured out are measurable phases of the moon and the passage of the sun as the earth rotates around the sun throughout a calendar year. Clive Ruggles, the emeritus professor of archaeoastronomy, which I didn't know was a thing, at the University of Leicester, he says that, quote, the site did not mark particular moon rises as changing patterns of moon rises are far too complex. The argument is that it represents a combination of several different cycles, which can be used to track time symbolically and practically. There are certainly hunter-gatherer societies who use the phase cycles of the moon to help synchronize different seasonal activities. But it's remarkable that this could have been monumentalized at such an early period. End quote. And I think that's, that's interesting for a couple of reasons. When we think of time today and why we mark time, it's for practical reasons. It's so that a shipment arrives, pun intended, on time in a certain location. It's so that you're not late for your meeting by a couple of days. So that you show up to your daughter's wedding on time. But for early man, in a lot of ways... And really, almost all the way through the Middle Ages, that was a secondary concern. The primary concern was symbolic and religious. The primary concern was that whatever you were supposed to do at whatever given day to please whatever deity it is that you're praying to, that you do it right. Because all the way through the Middle Ages, the concept is that that deity is what is going to control what happens to you in life. So making sure that they are happy or he or she is happy or it is happy. That's your primary concern. And that's been the primary concern of humankind for the vast majority of our existence. Only up until very recently did we start to move away from this idea that the calendar functions to help us make sure that God is happy with us. That's something pretty new. Now, obviously, this 10,000-year-old system is extremely basic. We're talking about using monoliths here. It, it's there for telling time. But it can't even give you specific dates and certainly can't even give you specific hours. Now, most of you, when you think of early man's ability to tell time based off monoliths, you probably think of Stonehenge. The earliest structures in what is today Stonehenge are actually would have been predated by wooden ones. 
totem-like poles, which were erected probably, we actually think, between 8,500 and 7,000 BCE. But they don't even know how those totems would have related to what is Stonehenge today. Stonehenge itself is is not even close to as old as the location in Scotland. It's only at about 2,500 BCE where these stones set up at the center of the monument. There are two types of stones that were used in Stonehenge. Larger ones called sarsens and smaller blue stones. The larger stones are erected in two concentric arrangements, an inner horseshoe and an outer circle. And the blue stones are set up between each of these in a sort of double arc. Now, I, I do want to stress here, there are competing interpretations even today about what the purpose of Stonehenge was. Some scholars do contend that it is a possible solar calendar because the entrance faces the rising sun on the day of the summer solstice. So it could mark that out. But on the other hand, the location of remains around Stonehenge suggests that it could also be a possible burial ground. But as I mentioned before, as we get further north, we see how these solar calendars start to predominate more and more. But again, this remains a very rudimentary system as we're essentially just marking out one day on the year. So you kind of have to judge everything from there. We can assume that if we can mark out that one day, that they probably had systems for determining the length of time, the length of sunrises and sunsets between that day. But of course, we're talking about pre-writing civilization here, so this is conjecture based off archaeology, not history. And archaeology is not my strong suit. Different civilizations divided the years into different ways. In ancient Mesopotamia, the solar year was divided into two seasons, the quote-unquote summer, which included the all-important barley harvest in the second half of May or maybe beginning of June, and then the winter, which does actually correspond roughly to today's fall and winter seasons. There were three seasons in the ancient kingdom of Assyria, four seasons in Anatolia, but generally speaking in Mesopotamia, it was natural to just divide the year into two parts, summer, winter. As late as 1800 BCE, in the city of Mari in the middle of the Euphrates, still, they were dividing the year in half. Now, most calendars in the Near East, and even in ancient Greece, are what you would call lunisolar. So that means they keep their months by the course of the moon, but the years they keep by the passage of the sun. This debate between how to decide how time is going to work on a macro sense, how are we going to measure years? This isn't something that got sorted out instantaneously. Because there are these two measuring devices. And so this debate about whether we should keep time by the sun or the moon, this persisted for thousands of years. And keep in mind, I've kind of mentioned this a couple of times now, but the closer you get to the equator, the harder it is to recognize the distance between the lengths of the days, right? Because if you live in the northern hemisphere, your days in the winter are dramatically shorter than your days in the summer. It's kind of natural to see that distinction and use that as a line of demarcation. But if you live close to the equator, well, it's hardly even noticeable at times, whether you're in winter or summer. Around the equator, the difference between the phases of the moon is a lot easier to spot than the difference between the winter and the summer solstice. 
even though in the northern hemisphere, the farther northern you get, and the farther south you get, that's easy. But by the third century BCE, time, generally speaking, is being kept according to the harvest. Sumerian scribes, already by 2400 BCE, are using the schematic year. 30 days in a month times 12 months, and that gets you 360 days. But the interesting thing is, okay, so days were starting to get sorted out. Years, well, that's a totally different matter. Years don't get sorted out for a really, really long time as I'm going to come back to here a couple of times, and I mean a really long time. Because most of the world right now follows the Western calendar, and I'd say the vast majority of the world, there's only a few exceptions, which is, you know, we go from year one, you know, the birth of Christ, and so on and so forth. And that's how we end up being right now in 2022. But that was absolutely not the case for the vast majority of human existence. All the way going back to the ancient world and the ancient Near East, almost every civilization is keeping dates according to the reign of the current ruler. So, you know, you would say in the third year of so-and-so's reign and so forth and so on. But then when somebody else took over, the clock reset. So you'd go back to year one of a person's reign all over again. So in order to have a sort of beginning to end chronology for any civilization, it wasn't enough to know what year it was. You had to know in chronological order the different rulers. Now, by and large, this didn't matter, of course, if you had a pharaoh or a king who lived a long time. But if you had a couple of rulers who died in quick succession, you kind of have to know how many years it's been. Still, also another problem is because most of these civilizations in the Near East, all the way through the second millennia BCE, they keep using lunar calendars. They had to get creative in making up time because there are 365 solar days in the year, but 354 lunar ones. So if you're using a lunar calendar, you have to keep making up 11 days every single year. Otherwise, things very quickly are going to get off kilter. I mean, after only three years, you're going to lose a month, six years, two months, so on and so forth. It's not long before winter is summer and summer is winter in that situation, as we're going to see happens. Even in Greece, the earliest sources that we have, clay tablets going back to the 13th century BCE, and then the writings of Homer and Hesiod, these all imply the use of lunar months as well. Hesiod, we know, uses a reckoning determined by the observation of constellations and star groups. For example, there are references in the text that the harvest would coincide with the visible rising of the star group known as the Pleiades just before dawn. Now, the Greeks are kind of known for the invention of reason and for using logic to determine the answer to problem. But if they're using a lunar calendar, then the question, of course, becomes, all right, well, how are you solving the 11 days short problem. So what they did was, and, they, and a lot of people did this too, to be honest with you. They just threw in an extra month of a couple of days. And this is going to be so common. You know, the Macedonians were using that system of, you know, 12 months, about 354 days total. We're using a lunar calendar. They were using that all the way up to the third century BCE. So Rome is fighting the Punic Wars at the time that this is going on. But if you're talking about calendars, nobody, and I mean nobody, in the ancient world, modern world, wherever, used a more elaborate calendar system 
than the ancient Maya. The ancient Mesoamerica was this tapestry of cultures, and we don't know everything about the ancient Maya, and I think that's one of the reasons I've always been so fascinated by them. But if you want to think about different ways in which we organize our year and how we count those years. And what that says about us is a civilization. Because I think this is one of those marks of a civilization where you can learn almost as much about their goals and aspirations, how they want to be seen, as opposed to what they are. But as I said, no one had a more elaborate calendar system than the ancient Maya. First of all, they had not one, but two calendars. They had a ritual cycle of 260 days and then a yearly calendar of 265 days. Those two ran concurrently, so at the same time. Taken together, though, they form a longer cycle of 18,980 days or 52 years of exactly 365 days, which they called a calendar round. Now, of course, as I mentioned, we're kind of looking back at these calendars through the mists of the past, and you can't see everything, so you have to imagine that the lens is slightly out of focus because... We have this huge gap between the end of the Mayan civilization and the arrival of Europeans. I mean, Europeans never really had to deal with the ancient Maya. Had they, I don't think Columbus would have gotten nearly the positive reception. So we don't know nearly everything about the 265-day ritual calendar. It's been called the Count of Days, but... You know, that's not a name necessarily that the Maya themselves ascribe to it. There's a lot of different names out there. This just seems to be the most common. So as I said at the start, when we were talking about the Maya, they had these two yearly calendars. And then within this count of days, within this 260-day ritual calendar, there's actually two more smaller calendars embedded There's a count of 1 to 13 days that just cycle through endlessly. And then there's a series of 20, what they would call named days. Unfortunately, we've lost the meaning of these two smaller calendars, and I I can't even hypothesize, because try as I might to look through the historical record, there's just simply nothing. No history, no archaeology. What I can tell you is that the 365-day calendar that the Maya used was divided into 18 months of 20 days plus one month that was only five days. Every civilization, really, when you go back to these ancient classical civilizations, they all struggle with how do you deal with this extra, you know, 360 seems like a reasonable number. We can we can parse that out in different ways. What do you do with those extra five days? And everybody seems to come up with a different answer to that. Well, the Maya just had one month, five days that they kind of tacked on to the end. Each ordinary day had a four-fold designation, okay? So each day had a day in terms of a number, in terms of its order, its day number, its day name in the 260-day cycle, and a day number within the month and month name in the 365-day cycle, all right? So each name day would have, you'd have 18,980 days in the calendar round, and every single one of those 18,980 days has its own unique fourfold designation, almost like a code, The dates themselves were kept on this massive stone slab. And the Maya instituted a 
long count, a continuous marking of time from a base date. Now, just to kind of give you an example of what some of these dates would look like, most likely, and most historians think that time started, according to the Maya, on what we would say is August the 11th, 3114 BCE. Now, like I said, though, this was in the fourfold designation, so it's going to have a day number and a day name, a day number within the month, and a month number within the 365 day cycle plus in its order. So if you would say, this is how they would say August the 11th, 3100. 14 BCE, they would say 4, Ahu, 8, Kumku. That's the first day of time, according to the ancient Maya. It's also the first of what's called a great cycle. Because the Maya calendar, and unless it was intended to be cyclical, you know, maybe there's multiple great cycles. That's the prevailing opinion among historians right now, I should tell you. Most believe that it was intended to cycle over and over and over again. If you think that the world ended at the end of the Great Cycle, well, I've got some bad news for you. That meant that the world ended on December the 21st, 2012 of the Common Era. So either it didn't end or I guess we're all living in a simulation at this point. Now going back to Europe, according to legend Romulus of the Romulus and Remus, instigated Rome's first calendar in the year 738 BCE. And it was adapted from an earlier Greek model, so it was lunar, not solar in nature. The original Roman calendar, and we always think of the Romans as very orderly, very militaristic, you know, things have to happen at a certain time. To make sure the legions run, of course, this is pre-legion time here, but the original calendar was 10 months and one year of 304 days. The remaining 61 and one quarter days were apparently just straight up ignored. This resulted in a huge gap during the winter season. The months bore the names Martius, Aprilis, Maius, Junus, Quintilis, Sextilis, September, October, November, December. The last six names corresponding to just the Latin words for the numbers 5 through 10. The Roman ruler Numa is credited with adding January at the beginning of February at the end of the calendar to create a 12-month cycle. And then in 452 BCE, February was moved between January and March. So now you've got more or less the 12 months, more or less the 12 months that we have now today. However, remember, the lunar calendar is 10 and one quarter days shorter than the solar calendar. So by the first century, the Roman calendar was a disaster. You know, because every year, you're losing 10 and a quarter days. So after, you know, three years, you've lost a month. After hundreds of years, summer had moved to winter, fall had moved to spring, and, you know, vice versa. The entire thing was a mess. Somebody had to reorganize it. And there was a lot of politics here in ancient Rome, and Senate couldn't fix it. The Senate couldn't fix hardly anything, though, especially once you get back to that first century BCE. So it takes Julius Caesar, who comes along in 46 BCE while he's dictator, and he decides he's going to fix it. And that's going to give Europe its calendar for a long time. The solar year was divided into 365 and one quarter days. So what he did was the year was divided down to 12 months, all of which would have either 30 or 31 days, except for February, which was the last month added, and it had 28 days. Commonly, in a 365-day year, but it would have 29 every fourth year in a leap year. That's to account for that one quarter day. Leap years, by the way, actually repeated 
February the 23rd, under Julius Caesar's calendar. There was no February 29th in the Julian calendar. So if you're going to use the Julian calendar, every four years, you wake up and it's February the 23rd. And then you wake up the next day and it's February the 23rd. Again. I just love to think of the idiosyncratic ways in which these different civilizations are trying to tame time. They're trying to make it logical in a fashion, although repeating a day seems like the ultimate illogical way to solve the problem, but that's what Caesar did. Now, to align the civic calendar in Rome and the solar calendar, Caesar just had to add days to the year 46 BCE because it was so far off. In the end, 46 BCE turned into the longest year in history with 445 days. Because of misunderstandings, different failures of calculations, and politics again, even this calendar wasn't established in smooth operation until 8 CE. The Julian calendar, while better, was still not exact. The solar year is precisely, for those of you who want to get mathematical, 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45.25 seconds. This caused the calendar, even the Julian one, which is a huge improvement, to regress about one day per century. Now, what's going to happen is Pope Gregory is going to come along and decide he's going to fix it, and he bases his restoration on the vernal equinox, which was then falling on March 11th, and what he does is he moves it from March 11th we jump forward to March 21st, which is the date that it occurred in 325 CE, which was the time of the First Council of Nicaea. And it was not the date of the equinox at the time of the birth of Christ when it fell on March the 25th. So what he does is he just advances the calendar 10 days after October 4th, 1582. So what happens in 1582 is... It's October the 4th, and then next day, it's October the 15th. And this sort of rectifies the problem. But how did it fix the problem going forward? Because we still have 365 days a year, and we still have a leap year every four years, right? Kind of. There is a leap year every four years. Unless... The year is exactly divisible by 400. So, for example, in 1600 and in the year 2000, very recently, there was not a leap year, even though there should have been because it was every four years, right? That manages to fix the problem. A further proposed refinement the designation of years evenly divisible by 4,000 as common, would actually keep the Gregorian calendar accurate within one day if we were to run it for 20,000 years. So as long as we keep these divisible ideas intact, our calendar should be fine until, well, roughly... 21,582, when I guess somebody's going to have to fix it. Within a year, the Gregorian calendar and the change have been adopted by the Italian states, Portugal, Spain, and the Roman Catholic German states. But remember, we're going through the Protestant Reformation in 1582 still, so all this is political and Protestant states aren't interested in adopting a Gregorian calendar that's Catholic, even if it's right. Gradually, though, other countries did adopt their Gregorian calendar, 
The Protestant German states did it in 1699. Great Britain and its colonies did it actually not until 1752. Sweden in 1753. Japan in 1873. China didn't adopt it until 1912. But they beat the Soviet Socialist Republics, who didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1918, just after World War I. But they actually weren't the last ones to do it. Tiny Greece did not adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1923. You know, calendars do matter. Fair dates were crucial in the Middle Ages. That was how people calculated when payments were due. That was how you all got together at the same time, the same place, to make these big transactions. But of course, it was never perfect. I mean, how many times in the podcast have I talked about medieval armies that are supposed to link up and they just miss each other and one of them has to go home after two weeks because they didn't bring enough food. So this was not perfect. It took a long time and a lot of changes in technology for our calendar system to be able to sort itself out. It's interesting to think about all the what ifs and the different directions calendar might have gone based off of, you know, what if the age of exploration goes the other way? What if we're using the Maya calendar today? What if we're using something from China? You know, because Europe becomes the dominant civilizations as a result of technology, by and large, military technology is what I'm talking about, of course. Read Guns, Germs, and Steel if you want the skinny on that one. And we all end up adopting these different European ideals and it certainly did not have to go that way. And then there's time itself. Dates are interesting, but more of an obvious need. I mean, even for pre-industrialized nations, they kind of have to know things for military purposes. Of course, there's some long-distance trade. It's limited in some periods, but it's still there. And then, of course, the ever-important and present religious need. So you have to know calendar dates to be able to do those things. But I think the more interesting question is to think about time on a micro level. You know, the passage of hours, minutes, and seconds, how we divide a day, and how civilizations throughout history have treated the question of time. I think it tells us a lot about our evolution as a species and also about us from a civilizational standpoint. It's interesting to think about how civilizations consider their own time in reference to others. I mean, just think about, here's what Mumford has to say, quote, One further characteristic of medieval space must be noted. Space and time form two relatively independent systems. First, the medieval artist introduced other times within his own spatial world, as when he projected the events of Christ's life within a contemporary Italian city, without the slightest feeling that the passage of time has made a difference. Just as Chaucer, in the classical legend of Troilius and Cressida, is related as if it were a contemporary story. When a medieval chronicler mentions the king, as the author of The Wandering Scholars remarks, it is sometimes a little difficult to find out whether he is talking about Caesar or Alexander the Great or his own monarch. Each is equally near to him. Indeed, the word anachronism is meaningless when applied to medieval art. It is only when one related events to a coordinated frame of time and space that being out of time or being untrue to time became disconcerting. Because this separation of time and space, things could appear and disappear suddenly, unaccountably. The dropping of a ship below the horizon no more needed an explanation than the dropping of a demon down the chimney. End quote. 
And of course, when you're talking about medieval art, he's absolutely right. Go and look at any painting right now, especially anything that, you know, is of a military perspective from the classical age. You know, Alexander the Great was still one of the most important figures in world history in the Middle Ages, even though it had been at least a thousand, if not more, depending upon what we're talking about when we're talking about the Middle Ages since he had passed. But still, look at those paintings and Alexander the Great, Caesar, it doesn't matter who you're talking about. They're all shown wearing whatever contemporary garb was at the time. It's just, it's something that we wouldn't do today ever. And it kind of illustrates the difference in which civilizations see time. I mean, unless it's a deliberate effort to try to modernize a story, you know, you wouldn't have a story from the Middle Ages in which people are using smartphones, in which people are driving automobiles. It's just a different way in relating to the concept of time. It's also interesting to think about how permanent time has been. And what I mean by that is, you know, since we divided time into, you know, 24 hours a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds there, it's been almost impossible to shake that. Revolutionary France in the 1790s, when the government adopts the decimal system. But even though the French are going to successfully introduce the meter, the leader, and other base 10 measures, all things that are viewed superior from a mathematical sense nowadays, France's bid to break the day into 10 hours, each consisting of 100 minutes split into 100 seconds, well, that effort lasted only 16 months before it came crashing down. Time is just different. Obviously, people could tell night from day and noon from dusk. But what I'm really interested in here is historically, when did humankind develop an understanding of the time of day? And I suppose the other important question is, when did we have to? Because you don't bother to understand something if you don't need it. And that's when I'm going to come back to what I talked about at the very beginning of today's show, which is, you know, Mumford, which is what got me on this whole kick, you know, he thought this all happened during the Middle Ages as an offshoot of monasticism. When it becomes important, i.e. critical from the medieval standpoint, to know what time of day it is so that you can say the right prayer at the right time to appease an almighty and omnipotent God. Now, we can't go super far back on this question because we cannot have any sense of whether any civilizations had a sense of time prior to the invention of writing. So unlike the macro level when we're talking about the year, we have kind of a, a hard end point with this. There's just only so far back that we can go. I mean, the question becomes, how do you divide the day before you can even measure it? Time is an artificial and arbitrary construct in many ways. So how do you divide it up? Well, the ancient Egyptians tried. They placed 12 deacons, which led them to develop a system in which each interval of darkness and later on each interval of daylight was divided into a dozen equal portions. These periods were known to them as temporal hours because their duration varied according to the changing length of the days and nights with the passing of the season. Right? Summer hours are long. Winter hours are short when you're talking about daylight. The only time when daylight hours and nighttime hours are equivalent is at the spring and autumn equinoxes. Temporal hours, which were then adopted by the Greeks and then the Romans, who spread them throughout Europe, 
remained in use for more than 2,500 years. Now, the first way that you could probably measure these would be with sundials, at least in a rudimentary sense and at least during the daytime. The oldest sundial we know, called the Nauman, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, dates to 3,500 BCE. But if you look at it, and you can Google it, there's pictures of it online, it's very, very rudimentary. By the 700s BCE, the Egyptians were using better sundials to divide the system that they created, which measured daylight hours versus nighttime hours. But of course, we're talking about a system that has huge flaws and major limitations. You can't use them at all at night, and frankly, you can't use them probably on a very cloudy day. They do not work indoors and they are not portable. In 280 BCE, the Greeks developed a device called the hemicycle, and that solved at least the problem of portability. You you can move this. It's really simple. It's basically just a block of wood with a hemispherical opening, and when you hold it up, the ray of the sun points to the markers within the cube, and it's supposed to show you the time, so it's a movable sundial. Great, so... Now we can move it, but all the other limitations still existed. Rome, if you're wondering, actually didn't get its first sundial that is the city of Rome until 164 BCE, well after the Punic Ages. And I don't think it's we can understate again the importance of religion here. When it comes to early man, and certainly by classical times and medieval times, the need to know what time it was. As different, increasingly monotheistic religions start specifying critical times for prayer, then it becomes increasingly important to be able to tell the time. And this is really a development of monotheism. And so I think... To a large extent, Mumford is right, although, you know, we need to talk about Christianity and Islam because for the first time, these monotheistic religions are saying it's not just enough to have a feast day. Pagan civilizations had a lot of feast days and Christian ones will as well. But more than that, they're going to specify, no, there's a really specific time during the day when you have to do this. Medieval Muslims, for example, were especially interested in sundials because these provided the means for determining the proper time for prayer. Indeed, actually, if you go back and you look at medieval Muslim sundials, they contain lines that only show a couple of times a day, and these are the only times at all because those are the only times that matter, the ones that correspond to the correct times for prayer. Although Muslims learned the basic principles of designing sundials from the Greeks, they definitely increased the quality and variety of designs available throughout the use of the Western world because of trigonometry. So how does Christianity start to push Europe toward the clock, or for that matter, a more regimented view of time? I do think Mumford's on the right trail. I think the answer is, you know, monasticism, you sprinkle in a little Charlemagne, and you get the St. Benedict's rule and its adherence to the canonical hours. So this is all kind of taking place between roughly 700 to 800 CE. It's time period in history that's actually referred to as the Carolingian Renaissance. Carolingian Renaissance is one of those brief periods of revival in Western Europe of learning and education, of biblical studies specifically. The theologian and teacher Alcuin is brought in to Charlemagne's court where he's supposed to standardize everything. Now, of course, the Carolingian Renaissance also 
happens to take place, you know, kind of in the period between when you have a lot of different Germanic groups migrating into Western Europe, brings down the old Roman Empire, but you don't have the Viking raids yet. So we have this little tiny sliver of space within which we can see an itty bitty renaissance, I'll almost call it. Now, a lot of the emphasis of the Carolingian Renaissance was in education reform, also in, in writing. You'll be interested maybe to know that it was during the Carolingian Renaissance and specifically Carolingian script when sentences got punctuation for the first time. Go back and try to read an original Latin manuscript from the third, fourth centuries. It's almost impossible. It looks like it's like a text of computer code. You have to kind of just know when the sentences begin and when they end. And so Charlemagne and his desire to try to make things more uniformly pleasing to God, because that's kind of the goal here, is how do we make our Bible study and our practice of Western Christianity uniform across the Carolingian that is Charlemagne's empire. Because if we can do that, then we're going to be overall more pleasing to God. So that's the structure and the idea. So there's this idea of how do you codify everything. And by the way, King Alfred in England is going to try to do just about the exact same thing. Now, writing and time, I think, are, are linked in this way. Both are somewhat arbitrary means, especially when you're talking about vocabulary, of putting order to the world around us. And medieval cosmology was all about order. You know, you've got the three different groups in the medieval world. You've got those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. You have the body politique, and you have all of these ideas about how God's perfect cosmos is supposed to work at a time when you could look around and say that almost nothing is working. And all this then sort of drives into the idea of the rule of St. Benedict and the canonical hours, which means that we do need to know what time it is because we have to say the right prayer at the right time. So in this case, purpose drives invention. But to be honest with you, looking back at it, it's not the purpose that I would have expected. I would have thought that military necessity or maybe commercial exigency would have been the impetus for the invention of the clock. But that's me making a mistake, and I think a lot of people make the same mistake, so I'm not alone here. I'm putting my own current Western ideals, and I'm stamping them on what would have been an ancient society, a medieval society at least, but ancient in many ways in terms of its outlook on the world. Religion was super important. It was, it was the most important thing to just about everybody, other than maybe growing enough food to eat, in the medieval European world. Christianity was it. it was the most important thing that people used to regiment their lives. So Europe has to be able to tell time now, really for the first time ever. So how does Europe get from the need to tell time to the ability to do so? Well, Europe's had some clocks for centuries. At this point, water clocks have been around since 1417. That's the oldest one that's ever been found, BCE. These are simple stone vessels that just allow water to drip at a constant rate until the cylinder would be filled. Usually there'd be 12 of them and you get 12 hours. Of course, this is a huge advantage to the sundial because you can use it at night. I did a bunch of research on this. But it looks like, by and large, most of these water clocks used measurements that were just arrived through via trial and error in order to determine the length of the time between sunset and sunrise. 
Now, the key to developing the mechanical clock is something that's called an escapement. An escapement is the balance wheel on a watch, or it's the pendulum on a grandfather's clock. What, it, what an escapement does is it allows whatever the gear is to tick in a steady rhythm, allowing the gears to move forward in a series of small but equal jumps. The key system early on was called a verge and foliate. A verge and foliate is a system that used weights to release the main gear very slowly. So it's a weighted system. So you figure out the weight that's going to be necessary to slowly turn the gear of the clock in a uniform rate. Now I should put uniform in air quotes when I say that because even the best virgin foliate mechanisms, even in the Middle Ages, lost two hours per day and had to constantly be reset. So you have to think at the beginning of the day, the clock was much more accurate than by the time that the sun was going down. The first escapement in the historical record isn't until 1250 CE. Still, clocks in their rudimentary sense must have predated this by several centuries and even decades. It tells us that medieval monks almost certainly used water clocks or candles to determine the proper time for their hours, because as long as a candle is cut to a uniform length, it should burn down at, you know, roughly the same amount of time. It goes without saying that, especially when we're talking about the rule of St. Benedict and we're talking about the time between canonical hours, all that matters is telling the time between the hours. So they're only looking for devices at this point that can be timed on three-hour increments because there were eight three-hour increments. So as soon as you start one canonical hour, you light the candle that burns down for three hours to the next one, and so on and so forth. Three hours in between. What this meant was that all that mattered was the time between what you were going to do next. Not that these hours necessarily followed a set schedule. And here's what I mean by that. The canonical hours were three hours in between. That did not mean that you always did them at the same time of the day. Even in the late Middle Ages, we get a couple of schedules from a monastery in London that tells us matins was done at the equinox of the year at 5 a.m. Matins in midwinter, though, was at 6.40 in the morning. And the same matins at midsummer, when the sun would be rising earliest, was done at 2.30 in the morning. Ergo, these clocks, again in air quotes, these timing devices, they're not intended to get us to the right time of day yet. They're intended to get us to the point that we know that we're three hours from our next canonical hour. Now, the Virgin Foliate model, and, and I know that this... You know, losing two hours a day doesn't sound good, but this is still a huge, huge leap forward compared to a sundial or a series of water clocks. Both of those things, of course, are dependent on human use. But the Virgin Foliate model was the best thing that we had for about 300 years. That being said, you know, we're walking through this historically, so what are the drawbacks? There are basically two. Number one, the amount of friction generated by the weights was just different for every clock. And so it was impossible to standardize the measurement of time. Times were different at different churches. Church bells might ring at different times depending upon how good and up-to-date the virgin foliate method was that was used in each one. 
The other one is deceptively important. Verge and foliate systems cannot work on boats. The swaying of the ocean is going to throw off any weighted mechanism, which means you can't tell time on a ship. Now, number two wasn't a big deal in, let's say, 1250, when this was invented. But go forward 300 years to 1550, and all of a sudden not being able to tell time on a ship is a huge deal. Because the age of exploration was at hand. And the age of exploration would force Europeans to come up with a better clock. I mean, after all, you can only calculate distance traveled if you knew speed and time. Now, that didn't matter much if you're traveling from coast to coast, island to island. But it's a pretty big deal if you're out in the open sea. If you're trying to determine when you need to turn your ship from, let's say, west to south, because you're trying to hit Barbados or Cuba, you, you kind of need to know how far you've gone, or you're just going to run smack into Florida, or turn too soon and just sail right down until you hit Brazil. This is a big issue. Plus, when you're traveling north to south, The sun changes position as you get closer to the equator. So trying to use sundials and items that use the sun to tell time become really difficult. So how did Europeans tell time on board ships? Early on, to an extent, they just didn't. Navigators found ways of sailing without having to measure longitude, which is much harder to measure without time than latitude is. Starting with a given position, the navigator measured the speed of the ship and the speeds of the ocean current. From this information, the navigator could at least come up with a rough estimate as to the course and the distance the ship had covered. And believe it or not, thanks to the skill and experience of most of these navigators, this educated guesswork, which is known as, quote, dead reckoning, end quote, is often very accurate. Now, as I mentioned, the good news was that measuring latitude, the north-south axis, could be done without an effective clock. So going from Portugal to Cape Town was a lot easier than going from Spain to Hispaniola. As uniform hours start to come into being, though, the question arises as to when to start counting them. And so early in the 14th century, a number of systems evolved. The schemes that divided the day into 24 equal parts, varying according to the start of the count. And this is kind of the difference, right? When does the day begin? That's where we're getting at here. Italian hours started at sunset. Yet if you were off in the Near East, if you were off in the Islamic Caliphate, started at sunrise. Astronomical hours, by the way, and this was bedeviling me when I was doing the episodes on the early explorers, because on sea, people tend to use midday, so noon. And great clock hours, this is used for like large public clocks, that they use midnight, which we appreciate today. Eventually, all of these competing systems were superseded by small clock, or what are called French hours, which split the day as we currently do, into 12-hour periods commencing at midnight. The question remained, how do you create a portable clock? And that remained a huge impediment. Bell towers could keep time in a town. But, you know, taking a stone tower on a ship is a pretty good way to get yourself sunk. 
So the answer to this problem is another new invention. And it's called the coil and fusi. The coil and fusi is a coin shaped device that was connected by a cord to the barrel housing the spring. So the way that it works is you, you have to wind up the clock. So when the clock is wound, it pulls the cord from the barrel into the fusi, so into this conical shaped thing. And the diameter of the spiral compensates for the increasing pull of the spring. So it kind of works like a balancing act. Early on, there's not going to be as much pressure overall on the fusi because it's wound so tightly. But as the spring unwinds, there's going to be more and more pressure. And this mechanism effectively equalized the force of the spring on the wheels. Thanks to this, clocks can now move. This wasn't the only system that was being used, though. A young Dutch astronomer and mathematician named Christian Huygens devised the first pendulum clock on Christmas Day in 1656. Huygens devised a pendulum suspension that caused the bob to move in a cycloid-shaped arc rather than a circular one. Circular arcs were inferior. No matter what they did, no matter what the inventors did, they gained and or lost time. This new invention allowed the clock to oscillate in the same time, regardless of its amplitude. Now, pendulum clocks were a huge step forward. They were about 100 times as accurate as their predecessors, reducing a typical gain or a loss of 15 minutes a day all the way down to about one minute per week. So you go from losing 15 minutes a day to one minute per week. That's a huge change. You're going to be a lot more accurate. And again, compare this to some of the earliest weight-based clocks that were losing two hours per day. In our modern world, we're kind of used to technology constantly evolving and fixing our problems. But you have to remember that we're still pre-industrial revolution here. So going from two hours lost to 15 minutes lost to one minute per week, that takes hundreds of years, but it's huge. Hugin's invention changed not only clocks, but the European home. For the first time, clocks came into the home as pieces of furniture. And so time transformed the way people designed their homes. And this meant for the first time in history, time was kept by individual families rather than by the community as a whole. But once again, the age of exploration created as many problems as it solved. Now that humans could truly traverse the globe, time had become universal. In other words, the day has to begin somewhere. There had to be one place in the world where the clock struck midnight and the day began. The only question was, where? 24 time zones now flow outward from Greenwich, England. Because of those, we can travel the globe. Because of those, massive corporations can conduct business on an international scale. But it's a relatively recent phenomenon. The problem, even heading into the 20th century, was that people had local customs for establishing time. This was a tradition that literally went back to the pharaohs of Egypt. And here it was, still in the 20th century, dominating the way people did things. It'd be like if you were walking around in a tunic. And now we've reached a point where time is just going to have to be subjective. I mean, come on. 
where the day begins for the whole globe, by definition, has to be subjective. You can sit there and we can argue until the cows come home that time is something humankind can measure, making it objective. But where the day begins, that's totally arbitrary. Our world is a circle. There is no starting point or an end point. So wherever you pick as the starting point, that's something you came up with. But you have to have it. You just have to. Think just about the age of exploration and moving goods from continent to continent. You, you had to know what time things were leaving. And the invention of the railroad is going to make this critical. As a Frankfurt Literary Society put it in 1864, quote, The more spatial separation is overcome, the more urgent and important is the need for a general, matching calculation of time, end quote. And this decision was absolutely going to be political. American railways, for example, recognized 75 different local times just in America in 1875. Three of those were just in Chicago alone. On November the 18th, 1883, American railroads decided to force the issue and began using a standard time system involving four time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. Within each zone, all clocks were synchronized. But this was only in one area. Throughout the rest of the globe, there were still problems, even in Germany, which we all think of as being very logical, very established. Even in Germany, when, when you were leaving, travelers had to clarify whether their departures were according to Berlin, Munich, Stuttgart, Karlsruhe, Luschwinghagen, or Frankfurt time. So you had to specify on your ticket what schedule you were following. This is the problem when you don't have standardization. And it's a problem that you really only have when you don't have standardization. And by the way, if you think that this was a problem that got solved by the turn of the 19th century, remember, Russia was still using the old Julian calendar as late as 1918 and was 13 days behind Western Europe. So if it was July 20th in Paris, it was July 7th in Moscow. And these two countries are allies in World War I. You kind of got to know when the troops are going to be there if you're going to coordinate an attack. And years, and I know I'm jumping back and forth to calendars, but years weren't even the same. Most Muslim countries continue to date the year from 622 CE, when the Prophet emigrated from Mecca to Medina. European nations dated events from the birth of Christ, 622 years before then. So if you wanted to sign a contract with, say, I don't know, the Ottomans or something, it might be dated 1915 in the West, 1293 in Istanbul. Now, the first priority for time reformers was to replace the world's impossible patchwork of local times with a universal system of territorial mean times. This was the dream articulated by Scottish-Canadian engineer Sanford Fleming and officially adopted by diplomats at the 1884 Prime Meridian Conference in Washington, D.C. And there it was, a world divided into 24 time zones, each with a single mean time determined by astronomers at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. So there you have it. The day starts in Greenwich, England, right? Kind of. France, amongst other nations, refused to go along. 
They were fine with the standardization of time for the world. But they argued it should start in Paris, not England. Paris was the center of the world. Not some place in England no one's ever heard of. So France adopted a nationwide, not international, mean time in 1891. Amazingly, it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century, so we're talking like 1950, that most of the globe adopted Greenwich Mean Time. And time zones within countries remain a national question today. Russia, the world's largest nation in terms of land mass, has 11 time zones. While China, the world's fourth largest land mass, has just a single time zone. Before 1949, the Chinese had five time zones. But after the Communist Party came to power in 1949, the government required the entire country to operate on Beijing Standard Time for the sake of national unity. <laughs> Calendar reform proved even harder. There were revolts in Bombay and Beirut when reformers pushed a consistent calendar. And this is, again, because this is a political question, 100%, and somebody is going to have to lose. When we decided to globalize time zones, time itself, calendars, it meant that everybody else was going to have to adopt what someone else was using. Of course, one option remained to just extend the Gregorian calendar to the entire world. Another, preferred by eccentric figures like Kodak, that's the camera, founder George Eastman, and Elizabeth Eichless, an American activist known in Europe as the Calendar Lady, was to start from scratch. You know, nobody wins, right? We're going to start over and we're going to have a brand new world calendar. We'll pick a, a new year zero. And that'll be a scientific modern calendar. But how scientific could it be, right? Like, because no matter what, if you think about it, like you're going to be influenced by the year that you're currently using, which if you're in the West and if you're using the Gregorian calendar means that whatever date that you pick going forward as year one is in some way related to the birth of Christ. It has to be. Now, many subscribe to a design that was articulated by a French positive philosopher, Auguste Comte. It was a perfectly rationalized calendar. It would be a year of 13 equal months, each of which would have 28 days. Major firms like Sears and Kodak, actually, when this was introduced, or at least brought up, had actually been doing their internal accounting that way for years. So people had been using this calendar, but proved almost impossible to sell. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the world did eventually adopt the Gregorian calendar, but it wasn't fast. The British Empire, not until the 18th century, Japan later than that, and Greece last in 1923. But getting off of the calendar for a second and back to the use of technology, if you can, okay, if you can carry a clock and if you can put one in your house, then when did we get one on our wrists? When people have been carrying watches since the 1700s, these watches mostly had to be wound. But in the late 19th century, the adoption of time zones and the expansion of business meant that you needed to know the time at all times, and it had to be right, increasing the propensity of people wearing watches. Wrist watches were actually very good for military purposes. Prior to that, people used pocket watches. For example, in the Boer War of 1899 to 1902 in South Africa, very common for members of the British Army to wear wristwatches. It's just easier to check the time than to take it out. But up until 1912, 
The concept of the wristwatch was, by and large, a female fashion statement. As it did with just about everything else, World War I changed everything. Consider the following account from a British war correspondent. Quote, The watch hands on the officer's wrists pointed to the second, which had been given for the assault to begin, and instantly to the tick, the guns lifted and made a curtain of fire around the chateau beyond Menin Road, 600 yards away. Time, the company officers, blew their whistles, and there was a sudden clatter from the trench spades slung to the rifle barrels and from men girdled with hand grenades as advancing companies deployed and made their first rush forward, end quote. World War I has a profound impact on the world in general. Americans tend to focus on World War II, forgetting that, you know, little spat that took place from 1914 to 1918. But World War I was a war in which everything was synchronized. Attacks along fronts that were miles upon miles long. And the wristwatch proved instrumental in making that happen. Time now had become a tool of war. Something that could be measured, something that could be used for strategic purposes for the first time ever. And so it was that by the end of World War I, wristwatches had gone from a feminine fashion statement to the ultimate martial example of masculinity. It helped their sales that they were also modern. Pocket watches were associated with the railroad, wristwatches with the burgeoning automobile industry. The wristwatch would remain triumphant until 2013, when the modern smartphone rendered them obsolete. Getting back to man's conception of time for a second, is there anything that's more arbitrary, more subjective than daylight savings time? Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. So said Benjamin Franklin in 1784. Not that he meant to take it quite as literally as we have. And no, Benjamin Franklin did not come up with the idea for daylight savings time. It's one of the many myths that has to be debunked when we start to talk about this thing that makes us change our clocks twice a year. Now, the idea is, this is where it actually comes from, okay? Daylight savings time comes from the notion that if you push time forward an hour, then as a whole, countries in the Northern Hemisphere will use less fuel, Contrary to popular belief in the United States, it has nothing to do with farm animals. Again, this illustrates the arbitrary nature of time. You can measure it and divide the days into hours, and then it does become objective to a sense. But when the day begins will always be arbitrary. And this, daylight savings time, also, again, was more of a political decision than anything else. The first country to adopt daylight savings time on May the 1st, 1916, during World War I, was the future loser of said war, Germany. The idea was, again, a way to conserve fuel, and it makes sense. And again, by the way, remember I said World War I changes everything, and World War I does change everything. And so the notion was, all right, if we push time forward an hour, then it won't be as expensive to heat homes in the time that it's daylight outside. The United States didn't adopt daylight savings time until March 19th, 1918. It was unpopular and abolished immediately after World War I. On February the 9th, 1942, now during 
another war. Franklin Roosevelt instituted a year-round daylight saving time, which he called War Time. This one lasted a bit longer, until the 30th of September, 1945. Okay, so up to this point, daylight saving time only is used in times of an extreme emergency, namely in the middle of two world wars. Daylight saving time didn't become standard in the United States until the passage of the Uniform Time Act of 1966. That's right. For those of you who want to rail against daylight saving time, or those of you who want to claim that this is something that's been around since the Founding Fathers, daylight saving time has been all around in the United States permanently for a little over 50 years at this point. The Uniform Time Act of 1966 created both that and standard time across the country within established time zones. The initial law said that clocks would advance one hour at 2 a.m. on the last Sunday in April, and then turn back one hour at 2 a.m. on the last Sunday in October. Individual states could still exempt themselves from daylight saving time as long as the entire state did so, and a couple did. In the 1970s, due to the 1973 oil embargo and again increased costs for fuel, Congress enacted a trial period of year-round daylight saving time from January 1974 to April 1975. But is this purpose even accurate anymore? Sure, I mean, you could, you could argue in 1916, in 1942, that moving the clock would result in less heating costs, because people aren't going to be out and about as much in the early hours of the morning before the sun comes up. And that's usually when the fuel usage increased. But that was all before air conditioning. Air conditioning now has changed the times that we live, and so now it's not necessarily, depending upon where you live, a benefit for more sunlight. Daylight saving time also has just continued to evolve. It doesn't even start the same time than it did during the passage of the Uniform Time Act in 1966. It now starts at 2 a.m. the second Sunday of March and ends at 2 a.m. the first Sunday of November. That change was advocated in part because of Halloween to give the kids more time during the daylight hours to trick or treat. Only two states in the United States today do not observe daylight saving time. If you're in one of them, you probably know. Arizona and Hawaii. It's really interesting to see through daylight saving time how time shapes our behaviors, but also evolving technology shapes time. Because until you have the invention of the electric light bulb, a lot of these concerns regarding fuel usage and so on and so forth, those didn't exist. The invention of the electric light bulb and other inventions allow us to expand and change our day in ways that shift the way that we experience time itself. And there's no bigger example of this than the idea of time and the Industrial Revolution. Up until the Industrial Revolution, the workday was largely divided into tasks. You worked until you finished the task base for the day. In other words, the workday was task-oriented, not time-oriented. However long it took you to sow the wheat was however long it took you to sow the wheat. The Industrial Revolution would change time again, like the monks did in the Middle Ages, or sailors and explorers in the Age of Exploration. One of the most interesting aspects to think about time is to actually go to film. If you look at the film Modern Times, which is a 1936 Charlie Chaplin film about the dreary lives of oppressed factory workers in Depression-era America, it has Chaplin's character strapped to a contraption that feeds him automatically, leaving his hands free to continue working 
in the assembly line, like he's a cog in the machine. In the film, the scientists who are behind the feeding machine market it to the factory owner as a, quote, practical device which automatically feeds your men while at work. Don't stop for lunch. Be ahead of your competitor. The Billows feeding machine will eliminate the lunch hour, increase your production, and decrease your overhead, end quote. Time had been measured before, but it had never been monetized like it was in the Industrial Revolution. Think about how that changes, how you value time, how you look at your day. In the Middle Ages, someone would not have thought twice about taking a long lunch if the day were hot or if they finished their task. You're all done harvesting oats. Might as well knock off early. But we don't measure our days in what we accomplish anymore. We measure our days, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, by time. Because we are now simply a cog in the machine. And the more efficiently that machine works, the better for industry. The other aspect to think about in the Industrial Revolution is that, starting in the middle of the 18th century, society dramatically changed and became much less rural. As a result, our tasks changed. The steam engine and the power loom produced goods in quantities that no pre-industrial craftsman could even dream of. Rural farmers, fleeing the depression in the countryside, went to the cities where they worked long hours, sometimes 12 to 16 hour shifts in brutal conditions. These were people who formerly had their day defined very much by the season of the year. Now, you're dealing with a set day. It's always the same. Start time doesn't change. End time doesn't change. And you work that time period, even if you're in the middle of a task, when the time ends. Suddenly, as one contemporary wrote, quote, time was spent. It did not pass, end quote. We went from before the Industrial Revolution, when you slept when you were tired, and you ate when you were hungry, to doing those tasks dictated by the clock. Factory owners would become obsessed with time, ironically, often hiding the clocks in their factories for more production. And this could get political too. Joseph Stalin thought the weekend was a bourgeoisie luxury. He abolished it in 1929 in a bid to transform ordinary Russians into good communists. So no more weekend. In the early 19th century, most Londoners didn't own their own clocks because they just moved here from the countryside where they didn't matter. But now they had to be up in order to get to work on time, not when they woke up naturally. So they hired knocker-uppers to get them up. By 1890, the time clock arrived on the scene, and now workers punched in and punched out, and time could be monetized right down to the second. The man who most embodied the industrial preoccupation with time was American engineer Frederick Winslow Taylor. He was active during the zenith of America's Industrial Revolution, so I'm talking about like mid-19th century, mid-1800s here. He dedicated his life to improving industrial efficiency and wrote a key influential book, The Principles of Scientific Management. In it, human beings and workers were treated as nothing more than part of a machine. But he gained followers, and Toyota was actually one of the most famous one of his adherents. From him, we get the saying, time is money. No matter how you look at it, from the beginning of human civilization until the present day, we've been shaping time, and time has shaped us.
The way different civilizations approach the concept of time as both an abstract and sometimes fixed concept tells us sometimes just as much about the civilization as the buildings that they built. Time isn't something that we think of as malleable, as changeable. But when we step back and we look at history, we'll see that time has changed. Our days are not the same as our days in the Middle Ages, nor are they the same in the classical world or ancient Near East. 